Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with class. So for announcements, uh, we have uh, pre-lab four and lab four due this week, or not due, but pre-lab four is due this week. Lab four, you will do this week. You will execute this week. Um, check on the upcoming assignments. There's a homework due next week. Uh, my office hours will be right after class if you have any questions, so stop on by. We'll also have a clicker today, so uh, be sure to have your clicker apps ready. And if you have any questions during class, please chat or unmute, and uh, I'll answer those questions during class. All right, so today I wanted to continue on with first order circuits and take a couple steps back just to remind you what we talked about last time. I talked about two approaches to solve first order circuits. First was the general approach, which we went through with an example of an RC circuit. And, and then the uh, initial and final value approach, which we will cover today. But just to remind you of that general approach, um, what we do for the general approach is you write um, KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, voltage division, whatever you have in your toolbox to create the first order differential equation that describes the voltage or current for which you are looking. And then you substitute in this general solution, K1 plus K2 e to the ST in for the variable you're looking for or the function you're looking for. And then you rearrange the equation to have a time varying term that will drop out of the equation and then you solve for S, right? Remember this squiggly plot plus a constant equals a constant that I drew on the whiteboard. That time varying term must go to zero and you can solve for S. And then uh, you, use, uh, you solve for K1 using the remaining terms of that equation and then you solve for K2 using the initial condition. Okay, so there's a, my last lecture was on that. Um, you can review that if you'd like. Uh, and then we talked about, let's move over to time constants and steady state. Let's see here. That was right here. Okay, so I, I drew a first order response uh, on the screen and I said, the transient is the time varying part. This part where the response has converged within 99% of the final values called steady state. So whenever I say steady state, it means the transients have died out. The transients have converged to a DC value. And then I defined time constants to be, well, this term T, I'm sorry, this term tau, in, in the, the factor that is e to the minus t over tau. So tau is the time constant. And when t equals five tau, then we get uh, that term going to just slightly less than 1%. We get it going to about 0.7%. Okay, and then after five tau, we say that the circuits have reached steady state. That happens for a rising or a falling voltage that is following this exponential change. And then I said, well, we can determine the, the time constant uh, for an RC circuit. So for every circuit that looks like this, that has a, well, for this circuit, for, for a circuit that has a series R and a series C, tau equals RC, okay? And that describes the convergence time of the responses, the current and the voltage, all right? so. Um, and then we talked about after a circuit has reached steady state, we can do a simple analysis. We'll do an example in 10 seconds about this. Uh, capacitors in steady state um, have no current going through them, right? Because the derivative of voltage is uh, zero. So capacitors can be replaced by opens when you're doing steady state analysis, which we'll do. Uh, inductors, since the current is not changing, right, the voltage goes to zero because di dt is zero. And so you can replace inductors with shorts. Okay, so we're gonna do that now. 
with an example. So that's a quick review of what we covered last time. And I left off saying, well, let's do a steady state uh, example where you have to solve a circuit in this steady state. So let's do that now on the whiteboard. All right, let's move over to the whiteboard. Okay, so this is an example of a problem that would be worded like this. Um, something like find some value, in this case, the capacitor voltage um, in the steady state or at steady state. Okay, so if you see a, a textbook problem, homework problem that says find something at the steady state, this is what you do. All right, so let's suppose you have a voltage source, Vs. It is 36 volts. It's connected to a switch that closes at T equals zero. And that is connected to, I lost, lost my pan calf there. And that is connected to an inductor And I'm going to add a capacitor here too. This is actually a second order circuit, but that's okay. It's just as easy to solve a first order circuit as it is a second order circuit in the steady state. Okay, so let's suppose we have some L value, which is 0 0.1 Henry's. Oops, 0 0.1 Henry's a capacitor C that is one microfarad and a resistor R that is 8K ohms. Oh, I'm gonna put another, so, sorry about this. I wanna put another resistor down here. We'll call this R1, we'll call this R2 and that's 4K ohms. And what we would like to find is the voltage VC of T, which is the voltage across that capacitor there. At steady state. Okay, so, so here's what happens. <clears throat> this inductor has no current through it before t equals zero. The capacitor has no charge at t equals zero. If it did, it would have discharged through that resistor R1. So at the steady state, there's, there's nothing going on on the right-hand side of the, well, anywhere in the circuit. And then when you close the switch, current starts flowing. It flows through that inductor. As the current tries to change through that inductor, we know the voltage, uh, a voltage will occur across that inductor. It will be induced because of the time varying current trying to go through that inductor. Um, um, I is, uh, L, uh, v is equal to L di dt here. I through the capacitor, I is equal to C dv dt, right? There's some current um, happening here because the voltage is changing. You have a derivative of voltage. So there's lots of stuff happening here. This is a second order circuit. And so we're not going to solve for the transient of this circuit. We could, you get, you get different types of responses, under damped, over damped, critically damped uh, responses here. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to solve circuits that look like this at the steady state. This works for second order circuits and first order circuits, okay? So how do we do that? Well, um, we assume that this switch closes at t equals zero, and then that switch has been closed for a long period of time. If, if a problem says the switch has been closed for a long period of time, it just means that steady state has been reached. So let's assume steady state has been reached and redraw the circuit. So we still have 36 volts 
we have a switch that's closed and it's been closed for a long period of time. We have a resistor down here, it still looks like a resistor. And then we have an inductor. Now remember, an inductor looks like a short because the current uh, is not changing. Remember, V is equal to L di dt. If current is not changing, that derivative is zero, so the voltage is zero. So I get zero volts here across that inductor. For a capacitor, I is equal to C dv dt. That means if voltage isn't changing, the current is zero. So we can replace that capacitor with an open. Okay. So that's that's what I'm changing about the circuit. Of course, the switch is closed, but the inductor has no voltage. The capacitor has no current. So I can replace them with uh, an, an a short for the inductor and open for the capacitor. And then we still have this resistor over here. And the voltage VC of T is right here. Okay. All right. So now we solve this problem. This is, this is for T much greater than zero in this case, because the switch closes at time equals zero. So long after that switch is closed, this is what the circuit behaves like. And um, we have a 36 volt source and then two resistors. And these resistors have the same current going through them. So they are in series. So because of that, I can use voltage division to find the voltage across one of those resistors. I want to find the voltage across R1. Okay. So VC of T, right, the voltage across that capacitor and that resistor, same voltage. Um, is equal to that source voltage times the resistance across which I'm trying to find the voltage, R1, divided by the sum of the series resistances. Right. And that equals 36 times, let's see, 8,000 over 8,000 plus 4,000. which is 24 volts or T much greater than zero or, or T much greater than whenever the switch was thrown. If this were five seconds, then you know, T much greater than five. Okay. So that's an example of when you have a circuit that is first order or second order and some sudden change happens like the switch closing and then you wait a long period of time right what's a long period of time until the transient voltages and currents die out or they converge then the circuit looks like this with the inductors replaced with shorts the capacitors replaced with opens and then you can solve the circuit using essentially the capacitors and inductors replaced with well easier structures, right? All right? And we will use this as a step in the second approach to solve for the transient response of first order circuits. But for now, does anybody have any questions on what I did here to find the steady state values of, or value of voltage for the capacitor? All right, nothing heard, nothing seen in the chat.
All right, so let's do a let's do a clicker problem. So grab your clicker apps. All right, so you have four circuits on the screen, A, B, C, and D. Which of these circuits is a first order circuit? Right. Remember what it means to, to be a first order or a second order circuit. For a first order circuit, the result is a first order differential equation. All right, take uh, 10 more seconds if you want to answer or change your answer. And we'll call time. All right. Well, a, a, a first order circuit um, has either is either an RC circuit or an RL circuit, okay? A second order circuit or a circuit with Rs, Ls, and Cs all in one circuit is a second order circuit. So these are all, are all RLC circuits. They all have resistors, capacitors, and inductors, okay? Or a resistor, a capacitor, and an and inductor. And so what happens there is, for example, if I were to write um, a KVL equation, right? Um, or let's say I'm summing voltages. Well, uh, uh, you would get, um, if I'm summing voltages, right, I would get a, a voltage across a, uh, in a resistor, right? I would wind up with the derivative of voltage using current across a capacitor, and I would get an integral of voltage across an inductor. So I'd have an integral and a derivative in one equation. And so you, you could take the derivative of that whole equation, both sides, and then you'd wind up with a second derivative, a first derivative, a function, and then, um, and then a constant. So whenever you have Rs, Ls, and Cs, you'll wind up with a second order differential equation. Okay. And so the remaining ch uh, choice is this, B. So B has only Rs and a C. And it looks a little more complicated, but it, that doesn't matter because you, you only have uh, either a capacitor or an inductor with resistors. So that's a first order circuit, all right? You could replace this capacitor with an inductor. You'd still have a first order circuit, but you can't have both a capacitor and an inductor in a circuit and have it be first order. All right, any questions on that? <laughs> it says combinatorial logic. That's a wrong title, but. Any questions on first order or second order circuits, not combinatorial logic? All right, nothing seen in the chat, nothing heard. Let's do another clicker uh, problem here. This is more of a survey to which I would love your responses. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, I am putting together uh, a, a practical electronics course. 
And part of that course is looking at sensors and this, the students in this course are going to build, um, they're gonna build a closed loop, con closed loop control with, with sensors. Um, it's gonna be a constant speed propeller for an electric aircraft and that's gonna be the project. But it requires some Ar Arduino exper experience and so I'm trying to figure out where to start. I'm going to do an, a basic overview or review of Arduinos and microcontrollers, but I want to make sure that uh, uh, I don't go too deep into the, into the basics. So I'd love to know, have you taken the level one workshop through the ITLL, which is really wiring and coding? What is it? It's, it's, it's having an LED blink. It's, I think, doing maybe some, um, maybe reading a light sensor, something like that. So if you've taken that, answer yes. If not, answer no. And there is no answer C. So thank you for the C, but there is no C. Okay, all right, I'll stop it here. Let's see here, got something in the chat. If we have experience with an Arduino outside of the ITLL. Oh yeah, that's right. I gotta add that to this. I would answer A, answer A if you've, if you've got, if you have experience with, um, with an Arduino to this level. So thank you for that. I'm gonna add that as a C. All right, so I'll stop this. And then another question is, has, have you taken Arduino level two? Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a, a closed loop control with a DC motor and um, a, 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 a propeller speed sensor using an, an infrared detector. And it's gonna be closed loop control. So you have to know like pulse width modulation, DC speed control. So if you've done, if you've done programmed an Arduino to, to control either a servo or a, um, a motor, then say yes. Or if you've done this outside of class, that's fine too. Again, I wanna make sure I'm teaching this at the right level. This class will be offered um, next, next semester in the fall. If you're looking to uh, do some more with electronics project projects and sensors and we're going to do some internet of things things too so this will all be controlled over the internet all right thank you for that and i promise one last question for today have you done level three workshop uh, level three is where you've done or if you've ever done serial control of anything using a microcontroller or have used any like the spy bus or the I squared C bus. Um, this isn't as important, but we're going to we're going to communicate, for example, with a temperature sensor using what's called a spy bus. It's really easy, but if if you if you have never seen it, it's really hard. And if you look at one slide on it and one function that you can download, it's really easy. So so I'm going to include it so that you will have if you take the class, you'll have knowledge of this. So. All right, will this class be in person or Zoom? I'm planning on holding it uh, remotely. So it will be it will be via Zoom. We'll probably have some meetings in person, but if we do that, those will also be available via Zoom, right? So you, you won't have to, if you're remote, you won't have to um, uh, travel from wherever you are, but, but there will be a lab component and it's going to be it's going to be a bit different than the current lab. Like the current lab is pretty much you know do lab one, do lab two, do lab three. This is going to be you start you start the lab this this project. Um, again, it's constant speed propeller controlled. It's going to follow the flight profile of a real aircraft in terms of speed. But uh, so you're going to start like week one and doing the mechanical part because you're mechanical engineers. You'll know how to do that. And then as we get more into uh, microcontrollers and sensors, a um, little bit on control loops, then they'll add that to your one project that will last the semester. It's not, not too difficult. It's really, I'm trying to make it fun. All right, thank you for those responses. It looks like lots of people have level one and not too many have level three. So I'll stop it there. I do appreciate that feedback. Okay. Um, So let's,
jump back to the present class. All right, so as I keep mentioning, there are two approaches to solve these first order circuits problems. And we talked about the general approach, right? And then we haven't yet talked about the initial and final value approach, but I'm gonna do that. So if you have an understanding of basically what's gonna happen in a circuit using the general approach, and understanding what I just said about um, steady state, currents and voltages become constant, then we can talk about this initial uh, and final value approach. Okay, so here is what that second approach is. And again, often it's easier. And as long as you can figure out what resistor value to use and what the time constant is, which I will teach you. Every voltage and actually every current in the circuit uh, of a first order circuit that changes with time will have this form. You know, we talked about K1 plus K2E to the ST. This is another way of looking at K1, K2, and S. Okay, we already talked about S as minus one over tau and um, tau is equal to RC. So in this form, we have VF, VI, and tau. And so T0 is actually the time when the step change occurs. So sometimes we say, you know, T equals zero is when the step change occurs. And so that would make T naught equal to zero. If, if the step change happens at three seconds, then T naught is equal to three. But VI is the initial value of, in this case, voltage at T equals T naught plus. Okay, so that means that right after the switch closed or right after the source was turned on, whatever, that's the initial value, okay? VF is the final value at steady state. Okay, it's the steady state value. That's why we just did steady state analysis because you have to know the final value. You have to know the steady state value in order to use this, I think, easier approach. And then tau is the time constant. And so if we can figure out the time constant for circuits that have more than one resistor, then, then again, this approach is easier. You can use this also for current. So replace V with I and you get the, you get the same equation, the same form of the response. Okay, so we talked about this. If you have a series resistor and capacitor, tau is equal to RC, right? We, we solved this using, using the general differential equation approach and we got tau is equal to RC, we saw that. Okay, what happens if you have an L? We did not solve the RL circuit yet. Um, but in that case, I will tell you, if you use approach one and you, you write a KCL equation or a KVL equation, you, you get the first order differential equation. You use that same approach that I described, having a time varying term plus a constant equals a constant. You use the time varying term, make it go to zero. You solve for K1 and, and S. And then you use the initial condition to solve for K2. You will find, after all of that, you will find that tau, what is what is in the, the exponential uh, on the bottom here, is equal to L over R. So tau for this series RL is L over R. Okay. All right. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to work in RL circuit using this approach. We're going to find VI, initial voltage, VF, final voltage, steady state voltage, and tau. We're going to do that with a simple circuit, and then we're going to do it with a more complex circuit. Okay, so, so remember these two time constants. I, I will rewrite those, but I'm going to take away the slide, and we're going to work, work problem now on the whiteboard. All right. So, 
So this is going to be an RL, that says RL at the top of the screen circuit. Using the initial slash final value approach. Okay, so let's start off easy here. Easy once you know it, when it's hard when you haven't seen it, but I think you'll see where I'm going here. So we have a 100 volt source VS and that's connected to a switch, just connected to a resistor. and an inductor. That switch closes at T equals zero. You have a resistor that is 50 ohms and you have an inductor that is 0 0.1 Henry's. Okay, and so let's. So what's gonna what's gonna happen here, right? The the inductor when the switch is open has no magnetic field. There's no um, current running through it. There's no changing current, so there's no voltage. It's not doing anything. The resistor has no current through it when the switch is open. Okay, then all of a sudden the switch closes, and current tries to flow. Right from the positive from the positive terminal of the source to the negative terminal of this source, since the VS is positive. That means current is going to try to change. Right, current is going to try to increase from zero, and inductors will oppose that change of current. Right, V is equal to L di dt. Di dt will be non-zero. There will be a change in current. So some some current is going to start to flow. The resistor is going to oppose that with a voltage. And eventually it's going to lose. Eventually at, after five time constants, the inductor is going to look like a short as we saw, and you're going to have hundred volts across 50 ohms, two amps flowing, and that's when you reach steady state. But let's try to find out what happens in between. <clears throat> so let's say, let's define this current I of T and voltage V of T. And let's find V of T, or let's find I of T first, and then V of T. Okay, so that's the problem here. We're going to use this initial and final value approach. Let's do this for all for all time. So that means for we have to solve for T less than zero and then T greater than or equal to zero. So for T less than zero, uh, and, and let's let's solve for i first. But for t less than zero, there's no current. I of t equals zero. You have an open switch. No current can flow through that inductor. Okay. Um, and so that's easy. Now let's figure out what happens when for for t greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> well, let's use the approach we talked about. I of T equals the final value, the steady state value, plus the initial value minus the final value times E to the minus T over tau. And we know that uh, tau is going to be L over R just because I told you that on the last slide. But again, if you solve this using the differential equation approach, you will find that tau is equal to L over R. So we know that already. We have to find I initial and I final, and then, and then we're done. We've, we've found I of T. 
<clears throat> okay. So what is I initial? Well, remember that for an inductor, um, we know that I of zero minus is equal to zero for this inductor because right before the switch closes, there's no current. And we want to find I of zero plus, right? I of zero plus is the initial current through that inductor. And we know that in between here, uh, V is equal to L di dt, right? So just like capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously, inductor current cannot change instantaneously. Okay. So, so that means that if the current right before the switch closed was zero, then right after the switch closes, the current has to be zero, right? You can't have this, you can't have these jumps, instantaneous jumps of current, because that would be an infinite slope. And we don't have infinite voltage here. We don't have, an, we have a hundred volts, so we can't, that can't happen. Okay. So that means that right after the switch closes, um, I of T is also zero. So that, that's the initial condition, right? That, that is I, I. So we've just found I sub I here. That's where the current is going to start right after the switch closes. Okay. So now we have to find I sub F. So we let T go way bigger than zero. So what does the circuit look like when lots of time has passed? Well, it looks like a circuit in the steady state where the switch is closed, right? The switch is closed. We have a 50 ohm resistor. We have an inductor that does not have any current changing. So this derivative is zero. That means voltage is zero. So it's just a short, that inductor becomes a short. And then we have what, 100 volts and 50 ohms. And we can figure that out. So someone asked, is I, I ever non-zero? Yes, that's absolutely true. I, I can be non-zero. Um, for example, it, let's not change the problem, but if I were to, if I were to put a resistor here and connect it right there, you know, uh, hundred ohms or whatever, then, then what happens is I have an initial current and then all of a sudden I close the switch and it is effectively removes that resistor from the circuit because I shorted it out and made it zero ohms. And then, so I would change from one non-zero value to another non-zero value, but we'll handle that later. But it, it, you'd follow the same approach. I initial would be, you know, two amps or something like that. Okay, but, but for here, this, in this problem, the initial current is zero. And the final current, IF, equals what we have 100 volts over 50 ohms is two amps. Okay. Um, and let's see. So now we also, I thought I had written tau up here. Tau equals L over R. I'm leaving this for a plot over here. Tau is equal to L over R, which is what? 0 0.1 divided by uh, 50, right? And that is zero. I'll put a line here to differentiate that. 0, 0.0, what is it? 0 0.002 seconds, right? Which is two milliseconds. So that's tau. So now we have tau. We have IF and we have II. We can write we can write the expression here for the current. So I of T equals uh, let's just write write it like Based on this equation, IF, IF is two, right? IF is two plus 
I I minus I F zero minus two, right? From right there. E to the minus T over 0 0.002. Okay. All right, and let's simplify that. So I of T equals two plus no minus minus two e to the minus so one over point zero zero two is five hundred it's five hundred t for t greater than or equal to zero okay so we just found the current. We used the form of the equation that describes describes every every first order, um, every variable that changes, every current, every voltage that changes in a first order circuit is described by this. We fi we figured out what I I I F and tau were, and then we plugged them in. Okay, any questions on, on that approach? Let's see, why would, you, why would you not use, got it, why would you not use this approach? Um, I, would, I would try to use this approach unless, unless it looked harder to use this approach. So for example, if I had to, um, if, if for some reason I couldn't figure out tau easily, and, and, and I, th I think you can, because you're going to see that we're going to have circuits with multiple resistors in them. So which resistor do you use, right? Or what combination of resistors do you use? I'll, I'll show you how to do that. But if it looks harder, to figure out that resistor value than just solving the differential equation. Then I would use the first approach, okay? Um, I'll say this, that most problems that you encounter, especially in this class, I would try this approach first, right? And if you're just not getting anywhere, then switch over to the differential equation approach. But I think most of the problems you'll be able to solve like this. All right. All right. So we found I of T. Let's let's find uh, V of T. Well, I is the current through an inductor. V is the voltage across an inductor. Right. So we know an expression between. We know um, an expression that describes the relationship between voltage and current for an inductor. V of T equals L di dt. So that equals L, which is what? 0 0.1 times the derivative of current 2 minus 2 e to the minus 500 t. All right, so we take the derivative of that. So that equals 0 0.1 times, all right, what happens here? The constant goes away when you take the derivative, uh, e to the minus 500t, the derivative of that is, well, minus 500 comes out front. So you get what, minus two times minus 500, oops, minus 500, e to the minus 500t, that's 0 0.1 times 1,000, e to the minus 500t, Okay, so V of T equals 100 E to the minus 500 T for T greater than or equal to zero. All right. So I just, you, I know the current, I know the current. 
I want to find the voltage so I can use this directly. Now, these are great. These are right. Let's visualize this. I think it helps to visualize what's going on here. Let's relate it to what we talked about, what we know what's going to happen in the circuit. You close the switch, the current starts flowing, the inductor pushes back against that current with its voltage. It tries to make the current not increase. It's going to lose in the end after five time constants. It has lost, right? It looks like a short. It cannot push back anymore. Let's take a look at what that looks like on a plot. Let's do this. Can't draw straight lines today. Okay, so let's look at current I of T and voltage V of T. All right, so here's what happens. Well, we talked about this. The current is zero until time zero. This is time zero here. And then the current right after zero, right, is zero, that infinitesimal amount. And then we get, uh, let's see, after a long period of time, after five time constants, we know it looks approximately like a constant, right? So this here is five tau. And in this case, this is five times two milliseconds, right? So that equals 10 milliseconds right there. So that's when it looks like a constant. And in between, we get this exponential rise. And it starts off with a quick rise, and then it does that. OK. So that's what current is going to do. It's going to be 0, start, the, indu the inductor pushes back. This is the transient, and eventually the inductor loses, and you get steady state. So that's the current. Let's look at voltage. Voltage is 0, right? Starts out at zero. And we know in the end, well, let's take a look at this. As t goes to infinity, you get e to the minus infinity if you're an engineer. You could take the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the minus t if you're a, a math major. But you get e to the minus infinity, that's zero. So at five time constants here, five tau, you're also going to have voltage equal to zero. So that's interesting, right? It starts at zero, it ends at zero. What happens in between? Well, uh, let's plug zero. Let's plug a little bigger than zero, right? 0 0.0001 here. And what's, what is the voltage right after the switch is closed? Well, e to the minus zero is one. So you get 100 volts. Right? You get 100 volts there. So you get this instantaneous rise from 0 to 100. Right? Well, how can that happen? Well, that can happen. Voltage across an inductor can, affirmative, can change instantaneously. Because um, current is the integral of voltage, right? He, voltage is the derivative of current, but current is the integral of voltage. And it's just fine to integrate a step change without having anything blow up and go to infinity. So, so you get this step change of voltage, and then this exponential starts off at one, and then it decays down to zero. And so you get this, like that. All right, so, so that's what it looks like. Um, let me say something else about this instantaneous change. For an inductor, I said that current cannot change instantaneously, but voltage can. If you were to look at a capacitor, I'll write it up here. Um, I is equal to C dV dt, right? I is equal to, that's, that's a capacitor, not anything to do with this problem. So in this case, voltage cannot change instantaneously because that would require an infinite derivative. But current can change instantaneously through a capacitor, right? So it's, it's different for an inductor versus a capacitor. But either way, this is what happens. Um, you see that there's, so before 
um, t equals zero, you can also consider this steady state because you imagine maybe something here at negative 10,000 seconds, something changed, you plug the circuit together. And by the time, you know, right before zero is reached, everything's steady. This is also steady state here because every, every all voltages, all currents are DC. And then the sudden state change happens. Then you get the transient response and then you get steady state again. Okay, so this is the transient. And that's what it would look like for this circuit. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to do next time, because I've hit the wall on time again. Um, stop sharing here. Or move over to the regular camera. So what we're going to do is next time we're going to apply this. We're going to review this approach. We're going to apply this to a circuit that is more complex. It has multiple resistors, right? How do you calculate L over R if you have many R values in your circuit? You still have one inductor, but many R values. So we're going to take a look at that um, and then we'll continue on with this second approach. So uh, in closing, don't forget pre-lab is due this week. You will have a lab to do this Friday. Check out the upcoming assignments. I think there's a homework due next week. Check out the PDF schedule file but that has all the updated uh, assignments and everything we're doing in the class. Thanks for joining the live class. Uh, if you'd like to chat uh, at office hours, uh, stop by and chat right after the, right after the class. And if anything uh, isn't working out well, please let me know. I hope everything is working out well, but if anything isn't, let me know. And so I'll start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to join, please join. Uh, if not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.